Hey y'all doing everyone? Now we are at the final book of the Enchanted World series, the 21st one, and I purposely did this for last, and, and while I did the Wizards and Witches, the first book on the first. Everything else in between was a mixed order, but the only order I did was, you know, make the last book last and Wizards and Witches first. So here we are, Gods and Goddesses. And this is the one my mother, when she collected hers long ago, this was the only copy of, it was the only book she did not get. I got her one eventually, and eventually got a copy of my own. So, of all the ones I grew up with, this one's the least known. I didn't realize, I didn't see this one until around 2006 when I was in college. So here we are. And of course this had a original owner of Cindy Batter. You know, because I got these used. Um, inside art, we got some clouds forming here. Ah, we have a god rising up. Looks like Hermes. In fact, it is Hermes. Well, let's take a look at the last. Up, oh, and Hermes flying away. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see where we can go with this. Ah, uh, like Magical Beasts, this one you know, talks about Egyptian gods, but a bit more detail. A wonderful depiction of various gods up here. God Kings of the Nile. Divinities of uh, preternatural wisdom and awesome power. The gods and goddesses of Egypt were depicted sometimes in human form, sometimes with the heads of beasts and birds that were their magical symbols. Jackals, lions, ibis, and other creatures that dwelled in the desert and on the verges of the Nile. Let's see what we have here. Angry at rebellious mortals, Ra silenced them by hurling his eye across the world. In flight, the orb turned into a vengeful goddess who ravaged the lands until halted by a ruse. By day, Ra rode the skies on, on his sun bark, illum illuminating the earth. Um, at night, he descended in, in, um, in another craft to ply the dark waters of Death's kingdom. A giant sized snake. What do we have here? Vivified by the sorcery of Isis, a snake reared up its you know reared up to strike the angry sun god. Only Isis knew the antidote to its agonizing poison, and she used this knowledge to gain power over Ra. We have the two sitting here. Isis and Osiris, her brother as well as her spouse, reigned together after Ra retired to the heavens. Under their dominion, Egypt flourished, for they taught the you know its people all the skills and arts of survival. This wonderful image here. At a feast held by Set, Osiris's envious brother, the host offered a splendid casket for a prize to any guest who fitted its dimensions. Unbeknownst to Osiris, the coffin, built secretly to his own dimensions, was a lethal trap. In prison, in his own sarcophagus, Osiris was set adrift by set to die in the Nile, in the Nile River. The corn god's coffin was caught by the current and borne swiftly away from Egypt. Isis searched the world for her mate and found his body in the land of Phoenicia, encased in the bark of a a tamarisk tree. Conquering her grief, she wielded her divine powers to bring him back to life. Hmm. Weary of his sufferings at the hands of Set, Osiris chose to descend to the underworld. There he ruled as Pharaoh in the realm of the dead. Well, we gotta continue on. Very gruesome image right here. A great battle. Let's see if I can get as much as I can. Let me know uh, if you want to know the artists of these pictures, because they do tell them in the back. 
Horus, son of Isis and Osiris, warred against his uncle Set for the throne. In the heat of the bitterest battle, the Set's routed followers took the shapes of crocodiles, hippopotamuses, and um, other wild creatures. Because we have Set here, there's Osiris. Hmm. Judged by Thoth to be the rightful ruler, Horus presided over Egypt's growing greatness and fathered the royal houses that would lead it through a millennia, millennia of glory. And here, now we go to the Greeks. Let's see. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole section. Well, let's see. A little, uh, I'm not going to read this part on the right, but I will read this one right here. Scepter willing Zeus um, was king of Greece's um, pantheon. He ruled the universe with his brothers, the sea god Poseidon and Hades, lord of the underworld. Zeus fathered the lyre playing um, solar deity Apollo, the huntress Artemis, lady of the, mo lady of the moon, fleet footed Hermes, wise Athena, and wine god Dion Dionysus. All out of wedlock. With, um, with his consort Hera, he fe uh, fathered deformed Hephaestus, whose wife Aphrodite, queen of love, casts a moor's eyes at the war god Ares. Pathian of a dysfunctional family. <laughs> Let's see. Born when the blood of a dying di um, deity mingled with foam to sea, Aphrodite was a goddess of love and beauty. Her provocative gaze it concealed her terrible power of blighting or, or blessing human lives. Interesting picture, but I guess you know they didn't want to choose the old-fashioned Botticelli. Hmm. After victory against the gods who preceded them, the brothers Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon cast lots to determine the territory you know, each would rule. Their dice were the ankle bones of sheep. Their prize, uh, um, their prize is the mastery of air, sea, and underworld. Hmm. This is a very um, light picture, but interesting when you get to see it. Sleeping Zeus was trussed for slaughter by his jealous wife, but hundred-handed um, um, Briarius secured him, um, swiftly disentangling the, no um, the knots that bound him. Secured him, that's what it was. Very interesting um, snake here. Furious at her husband's infidelities, Hera summoned the serpent dragon Python to hunt down Leto, one of Zeus's paramours, um, to the ends of the earth and devour her along with her illegitimate offspring. Young Hermes found a tortoise shell and used it to devise the world's first lyre. Intrigued by the instrument's sweet sounds, Apollo befriended Hermes, received the lyre as a gift, and became the patron god of music. Hmm. Flung by his mother from the Olympian heights, Hephaestus um, plunged to the sea. There, the scene of Thetis rescued him and nurtured him until he grew to manhood. Uh, bright for the underworld. I'll read the captions here. Persephone, gathered flowers, was abducted by Hades in the world. Combing the world for her daughter, Demeter found only a scrap of her clothing. At Demeter's behest, Hermes went as envoy to Hades to retrieve the maiden. When Hades released Persephone for part of the year, Demeter rejoiced. Through this story is where we under um, how we have winter and spring. When she is in the underworld, that's where we have winter, and when she comes back, where we get the spring. Ah, and here, speaking of uh, Hephaestus and Aphrodite, to catch his wife in the act of betrayal, Hephaestus set a trap from the ceiling above the violated marriage bed. A net descended to imprison Aphrodite and her lover Ares. Of course, you read a little bit of text here. Um, he tried to humiliate her by ca catching her in the act with Ares and invited all the gods to say, "Look what's ha look what she has done! Isn't this a, just, um, isn't this awful? You know, disgraceful!" 
Except the male gods looked at, you know, looked at the situation and thought, hey, you know, if she can, you know, she could, you know, they probably have a shot with her, especially Zeus. So his plan didn't quite work. Pregnant with Zeus's child, a mortal princess, Samil, received a visit from an aged stranger. Unaware that the crone was Hera in disguise, Samil followed a vice that led to her own destruction. And we have this picture here. Rescuing dead Samil's unborn child, Zeus sheltered it inside his own thigh until it came to term. Thus Dionysus, the only god with mortal blood, entered the world without a um, mother's labor. Here we have a, um, a relief of scenes from centaur, satyrs, you know, people, of course. And around here, I'm going to keep it here while... Um, inflamed by wine, Dionysus gathered a band of followers and ran riot through the world, spreading the gift of the curse and the curse of intoxication. Hmm. Wonderful picture here. Some dolphins on the side. Uh, looks like a lion and a tiger on the ship, and also a panther on the sail. So what is going on? Kidnapped by pirates, Dionysus took a terrible revenge, causing vines to ensnare the vessel and wild beasts to roam its deck. I'm going to go ahead and read this section here. This is a Celtic um, um, story about the um, let's see, about the, the Morgan Spectral Queen of War and its wake. Um, let's see. The Morrigan, High Queen and the Goddess of the Tuatha Dé Danann, watched over the welfare the war and warfare of that of that fairy folk while they struggled against the Furbolg people to claim the soil of Ireland. But the bards and blind harpers who lulled um, who lulled warriors to set at night after days of grueling battle conveyed his parrot. Conveyed this paradox. De Morgan was not one goddess, but a trinity. She was a spir single spirit in fierce intent, possessing possessing uh, at least three different names and a trio of separate selves. Maka, they called her, when she worked magic with the blood of a slain. Uh, Babbed, um, they they named her that when she took to, uh, took the giantess form and warned soldiers of their fortunes on the eve of war. And they knew her also as a shape-shifting Neiman. All three were, able, um, were wont to slide into the flapping black bodies of carrion crows to haunt battlefields. Hunger, hungry for the um, morsels they um, filched from torn and broken bodies when, they, um, when the fray was done. That's it. Terrible though they were, um, and feared as greatly as the Tuatha did on themselves as by their foes, the, tri the triad strove with all the su superhuman strength to tip the war scales into Tuatha's favor. The singers in the halls of the mighty loved to recall the day when the Morrigan um, worked the Furbolgs on duty, undoing with firestorms. A hail of frogs a tor and torrents of blood that turned the ground into a steaming, suckling bog. By thus confounding the advancing enemy, the triple goddess brought time in her favor, uh, on her favorite side, allowing the Tuatha to marshal their forces, hone their weapons um, sharp and bright, and win not only the war, but Ireland itself. Reaper of the Battlefield after the battle, Maka, the goddess of war, cloaked in the feathers of carrion bird, looked on at the bodies of the slain were heaps upon uh, were heaped upon her. Those of her chosen side were interred with all the due uh, obsequies under the greatest stones of the clans. But the fo but the foemen who, who had fallen were dismembered, their freshly severed heads, some with battle cries still frozen on lips, others with mouths fixed in the rictus of, the f um, of a fearful grin were impaled on stakes and raised up in the ring to do her honor. No tribute, no tribute pleased her better. A warning to all her enemies, these hinges, which were known as the ma mast of Maka, were... Um, stood in the open countryside for all to see, while the birds and, um, and the elements um, worked their own transformations upon them. Portender of Calamity When the morning mist um, still floated low over the hills of Moorland, a woman of 
of giant of giant dimensions came striding down to the river. Her legs grew um, great columns of flesh straddled the streams, and her feet rested on the stone stepping stones of the of the ford uh, as she bent to her washings. The clothes she scrubs were not her own, and her great hams of hands, they you know, they seemed as tiny as a swaddling of a doll or an infant, yet they were the garments of full grown soldiers bound for battle. And she, suffice to say, was an ordinary peasant laundress, but the goddess uh, bad a, a aspect of the Morgan. Warriors of, of, on the march dressed you know, dreaded meeting Bab when they crossed the stream, for if they saw their, you know, her wringing out clothes they recognized as their own, and the waters uh, ran red with blood, they knew they would not survive the clash to come. Mother of Mourning she who loved war um, had also to love death, to celebrate it in the howling ecstasy of grief and lamentation. Some chronicles maintain that among the Morrigan three incarnations, it was the elusive enigmatic Neiman who first devised the art of keening. This ritual wailing was the music that um, accompanied the spirits of the dead to their final home. Torn first from the throats of newly made widows, the singing of their songs of loss became a prerogative of, the, of a sorority of black clad crones. When the vagabond of corpses trundled back to the fields of battle, the mourners' um, ululations um, filled the sky and drowned out the winds howling from the sea. It was said that whoever, you know, whatever carrion birds screamed to one another over the bodies of the fallen, the voice of the Morgan was heard in the land. Denizens of Eternity. In this chapter, we're going to talk. It's going to talk about the. Um, Oh, um, Gods of India. Don't know how much captures they give over here. Let's see what we got. Let's see. A winged wonder that bore the gods aloft, haloed in glory to God Vishnu and his consort Lak um, Lakshmi, rode through the skies on a mount that was itself a divinity. Great in power and remarkable in form, the name of this being was Gar um, Garuda. Its head, talons, beak, and wings were those of an eagle, or, some said, a vulture. Its limbs and trunks were of human shape. Garuda was of the size of a strength unequaled. As the creature flew, the beating of its great wings caused the whole earth to wobble and overmaster the monsoon. When not conveying the gods on the mysterious mission, Garuda skimmed out low over the, sky of the earth, hunting for sinners. With a thrust and a snap of its beak, it could fall upon the wicked and, de and devour them as if they were worms. Hmm. Interesting picture here. We have a snake with multiple heads in reference to um, um, the story that told in the Book of Dragons. The nectar that gave the Indian di you know, deities eternal youth was lost in the waters of the primeval sea. To retrieve it, Brahma ordered that, um, that the vast ocean be churned like milk, using armies and, of godlings to an, up, an uprooted mountain, and a, a sacred serpent who offered um, himself as a rope. Here we go. Ignored by her ascetic, um, ascetic mate, the goddess um, Parvati languished, but Siva's attentions were fixed on the infinite, distracted neither by her caresses nor by the snakes that nestled in her hair, in his hair. Hmm. Here, what we have here. Why the patron of wisdom had a pachyderm's trunk. Ganesha, Ganesha um, with his fat human body and elephant's head, was the Indian god of wisdom and success. A gluttonous fondness for the fresh fruit of rice cakes offered by his adorning followers gave him um, his pot belly. The origins of the, elephant, of the elephant head was more mysterious, but one story explained it this way. The goddess Parvati um, wanted a doorkeeper to protect her privacy in the bath. She blended dried skin from her body um, with uh, magic urgent un unguents. Unguit, to form a living boy. Assidious in his duties, Ganesha refused even, you know, even entry to, uh, to Siva, Parvati's husband, who one day, in a fit of tra a temper, slashed off the boy's head. Overcome with remorse, Siva took the head of the first creature he, you know, he encountered and planted on the soul, soul, child's um, soldiers. But in one sense, this proved a blessing for the boy. 
When he acquired an elephant's head, he also gained great virtue, for the noble beast was the embodiment of prudence, pity, and sagacity. Hmm. Many of you already know what this picture would be. Kali, queen of death and terror, adorned herself with severed heads to drink the blood of, its, um, of a, a victim and dance upon his corpse. Here we are. It was decreed that only a woman could slay um, Mahishasara, a shape-shifting monster who menaced the universe. Therefore, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva together created a twelve-armed goddess, uh, Devi, who rode into battle on a lion and destroyed him. Hmm. Don't know if I want to read this one. Let's see how much it is. I don't think I'll skip this one. Again, I skip some of these stories, you know, because one, I have limited um, uh, limited space on my camera, but I also want to encourage you to pick these books up and read, you know. Tale of Radiance Reborn. Then this is a tale from Japan. See someone blowing up uh, three children from the wind. Or sucking them up, I don't know. He's just talking about the Japanese gods. You don't read much about them. A book like this may give me an opportunity to read a tale about them. <laughs> and of course, the fourth chapter deals with probably one of the most popular mythologies of the gods of the Norse, uh, the Norsemen. Prideful rulers of the Elder World. Odin, chieftain of the war-loving gods, named the Aesir, battled giants, seduced mortals, and woke the dead in his quest to, uh, for occult wisdom and absolute power. Kind of hard to see this. It's like two shadowy people. You can see through them. Um, they like struggling. Oh, there are three. Oh, there are three women. Okay, that's right. The Norns, a triad of divinities older than time, the Norns were skilled at weaving, but their cloth was the web of fate. Once woven, no power could alter its pattern. Hmm. A foggy um, picture here. He's like, the Norse deities were vulnerable to the corruptions of the flesh and, and the ravages of time. They knew how to forestall death, but not to conquer it. Yes, they were one of the goddesses who um, were you know, could give them golden apples, and from her, if given from her hands, they can stay useful. Master of Thunderbolts, Thor was a lord of war and justice. In his charge lay the order of harmony and universe. Without his vigilance, all would be chaos. Ah, uh, here it is, Freya. Goddess of fertility came to live as a hostage among the Aesir after their battle, uh, bitter wars with an alien Pathian. Cats were her symbol and familiars. Let's see, we got more here. Ah, oh, there we go. Let's see, consort of Odin, the powerful mother goddess of, uh, in her own right. Frigg and Frigg was patroness of marriage and uh, fecu fecundity. She rode in a chariot drawn by sacred rams. Up. You see, guess what this is? Sometimes shunned and sometimes exploited by the Aesir, the trickster Loki roamed the world of mortals, gods and spirits, sowing mischief and disharmony. We'll keep going here. Uh -huh. Master of disguises, Odin often journeyed undetected through the realm of giants, dwarves, and humankind. I think images like this is one of the inspirations of the character Gandalf. One of them. There are obviously several. The warnings of the Sibyl echoed in the firmament. The gods' own evil would re re redound upon them, and they were doomed. Ah, uh, Ragnarok. Uh, here we go. The Valkyries scored Earth's battlefield to claim the souls of dying heroes. 
These champions were born to Asgard to, con to constitute Odin's ghostly army. Off to the, all of Valhalla. Doomed Unleash. I think this is the last section of the book here. It talks about um, of the events of Ragnarok. And the great, great wolf here, you would all know what this is. Vengeful and bloody hungry, the Fenris wolf erupted from the underworld pit where the gods had chained it. Its liberation signaled that the end of the world was imminent. Omens of catastrophe appeared in every sphere. The great ash tree at the, um, at the core of the universe crackled asunder, and Hemdal, the heavenly um, sentinel, blew a warning blast on his horn. Questing for help in a time of terror, Odin sought wisdom greater than his own. He consulted the magical preserved head of a long departed sage to learn that, um, what actions might forestall disaster. A flotilla of unearthly enemies sailed against the gods. Its flagship was a vessel made of dead man's fingernails, and Loki, lord of destruction, stood at its helm. Famous battle here. In the final battle of the great plain before Asgard, the Thor wrestled with the monstrous Midgard serpent, matching his thunderbolts and hammer against the reptile's venomous exhalations. And of course... A bird carrying a person uh, in its claws. The aftermath of war was emptiness. All giants, gods, and humans dead. Only those birds that fled, uh, fed on corpses' um, flesh survived, and even they disappeared into great fires and floods and engulfed the earth. If you look closely on this picture here, you see not only a hut, you see a, an eye here. What is this? Let's see if it tells us. A new world, green and fertile, rose from the mud and ashes of the old. Birds, beasts, and humans reappeared to dwell once more upon the land. But underground a dragon, evil incarnate, awaited. <laughs> that is it. That is the end of all as all 21 books of the Enchanted World series, last one being Gods and Goddesses. Thank you all for watching, and you know, for those of you who you know got to see every one of these videos, thank you again. That um do, if you find these at Fascinate, you can easily find these on Amazon. Um, the references and the, the pictures and the, and the text are found in the back of each of these books. That is the Enchanted World series, ending with Gods and Goddesses. Thank you very much for watching. Y'all have a nice day.